You're listening to KFAI's special day of programming in recognition of Black History Month. Uh, I'd like to also welcome uh, the Honorable Council Member Marion Berry uh, speaking with us from Washington, D.C. Live. Live. Uh, and Mr. Berry? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, and a pleasure having you on our show. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Glad to be on. We're doing fantastic. We're looking forward to hearing your hearing your reflections on the Voting Rights Act, the past, present, and future as a as a legendary politician that has has fought a struggle uh, for many decades. Well, let me give you a little little background. You already know this, but for your for your audience is that uh, I was uh, the first chairman of SNCC. We, we formed we were formed in April of 1960, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee grew out of a call that Dr. King made to get young people to come to a a conference in Raleigh, North Carolina, on Easter weekend, and uh, which is kind of uh, interesting because you know you can't have a resurrection without a crucifixion. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we formed it, and and et cetera. Uh, and during the summers of '61, two, three, I was working in Mississippi. When we went to Mississippi. In 1961, even though black folks made up 40 percent of the population, only three percent were registered. It was almost impossible to cite the Constitution of Mississippi, a lot of other kind of things. And so, in 1964, was the big push uh, when we had the summer project. Over a thousand, mostly white people. Uh, Jerry Brown, who has been governor, et cetera, now, and some other people. Uh, sons and daughters of editors of Time Magazine. So we opened. Bob Moses was the author of that. And he opened up Mm -hmm. Mississippi because those sons and daughters were down there getting arrested or beaten, and they had to write about it, you know. So so that was that situation. And so when the uh, Voting Rights Act of 65 came, it was was just a long, sought-after goal to try to end this racial... Uh, segregation as well as at the ballot box and, and et cetera. In fact, during this struggle, Fannie Lou Hamer, who we all know was one of the most outstanding freedom fighters around, was a sharecropper. She probably went to about the sixth or seventh grade. And when she went down to register in Roosevelt, Mississippi, Sunflower County, uh, they arrested her. And by the time she got home, she got a notice from the uh, to let sharecroppers mm-hmm. are leasing the land from some use a white person. Mm-hmm. They got all this land out there. She got to notice that she had to be out of her house the next day. Otherwise, they're going to come get her stuff and throw it out. And so she had to scuffle around to try to do that. Uh, and so that's just one example of how mm-hmm. tough it was down there. Uh, when I went to Macomb, Mississippi in 1961, uh, Herbert Lee had just gotten killed on the uh, Pike County courthouse steps because he mm-hmm. wanted to register. Mm-hmm. Actually, he was, they had a jury trial about a month later, and all 12 white people uh, absorbed the guy that was supposed to have been doing it. So it was rough by now. I, I tell you all this to say that we can look back now, and, and I, I have this other philosophy. As long as the lion tells the story, he will be king of the jungle. So I'm mm-hmm. uh, giving this information because... <laughs> Uh, we need to tell our own story about what happened. And so now Mississippi has more African-American elected officials than any state in the nation, uh, from 3% to where we are now in Mississippi. I was born in Mississippi and grew up in Tennessee. So it's been a godsend to us um, in terms of uh, desegregating the ballot box and making it easier. I think before the Voting Rights Act, I think we had four or five black congressmen. Now we got over over 40, last time I counted. And places you never thought you would get, like people from like North Carolina and South Carolina, uh, and, uh, uh, other kinds of people who've been working on that. So we, 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 we think it's been very effective. It still needs to be continued. Every, every, I think it's every 10 years. There's always a reauthorization. It's always a fight. We can't give up. we got to continue to push as hard as we can because the ballot box can make a big difference. When 
people elect, people like myself and others, who believe that you use politics for economic reasons. As I did in terms of increasing D.C. Uh, government contracts from 3% to uh, 47%. Uh, that's power. You know, white people will socialize with you. They'll, you know, now they will. Uh, they'll invite you to the parties and they'll go to the country club with you sometimes. But when it comes to economic, uh, economic pie, they don't want to let go. That pie, you want to fight, you just try to try to give some black business people uh, a percentage of what's uh, being done out there, and you're going to have to fight to the death. Well, Mr. Allen had a question for you, uh, yeah. uh, Mr. Berry. Uh, yeah, Mr. Berry, uh, my name is Don Allen. I'm with the Independent Business News Network. But the question I have is you just talked about some racial incidents, some violence that happened in the past. Uh, and it's a two-part question. Today in 2011, it seems like we have a lot of uh, that same stuff but on a different different level, which is covert. Like they'll throw a rock at you and hide behind the building. So you don't know who's throwing a rock at you. Uh, how do we get past that point? I mean, today, uh, where are the African American or Black, whatever you choose, organizations uh, that should be out advocating and lobbying for us? And and lastly, what did you think about President Barack Obama's uh, State of the Union address, where he did not again mention the poor or poverty? Go ahead, sir. Uh, a couple of things. One. Uh you know, when you had racial segregation, it was just as clear. You could see it all around. You, you saw a white and colored uh, sign. I remember, I remember I was growing up in Memphis, and it had a white sign, colored sign. So I, I was shopping with my mother, and so I said, let me taste this water. I mean, I guess I said it to myself. So I went to the white fountain. My mother came and snapped the heck out of me and said, don't do that. <laughs> that me the rest you kind of thing. But that's how bad it was. But it's more subtle now. You, know, you want to get a loan for something? Uh, you know, the banks still discriminate. Yes. Red line, et cetera. Still, if you look at the airline industry, uh, you don't find hardly any black pilots. So it's, it's it's taking a different form that you can't uh, hold on to. You can't feel it, except individually you can feel it. There's still rampant discrimination, even in the federal government. But... It's like one or two, three or four here where it's segregation. You saw it everywhere across the board from A to Z, and it's harder to get at. You know, and 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 this young generation, I have a 30-year-old son, and they don't understand the struggles we went through. So therefore, they don't push and, and, and protest as hard. Um, that's why I was I was just excited about what was happening in, in uh, Egypt and in Libya, other places where they Baran. And so that's what the difference is. The NACP uh, fought hard, the Legal Defense Fund, against legal segregation. They fought hard for social justice, but you can't see it as clearly. So therefore, the people who are victims uh, are not as vocal about that because they don't maybe understand we're not doing a good job of teaching, teaching them how to struggle. In terms of Barack, you're right. I mean, another thing he did not mention, which we in Washington suffer from, we uh, don't have any representation that who can vote in the Congress. Uh, we don't have any senators. We're larger than five other states. Like Delaware has two senators, one congressperson. We pay uh, billions of dollars, three point five billion dollars of federal income taxes here, and yet we can't vote. So he mm. should have mentioned that too. Yes. And uh, Bill Clinton mentioned it in, in one of his. Uh, Stated the uh, nation addresses. Well, I, I know Mr. Rees has, has been dying to answer, ask a question, too. Go ahead, Mr. Rees. Uh, no, I, uh, I, Don kind of hit on it already. Um, no, I just, I like listening to folks tell about their old stories, to be honest with you. Uh, I, in fact, uh, Brother Bear, I've read up all about you, man. I read the history of SNCC, uh, you know, several times, over and over. And uh, I'm always, uh, I, I think I'm always just dumbstruck at the courage. I, I'm just curious, did you all, when, you, when you're in the middle of that fight, when you were part of SNCC, when you were in the middle of that fight, did you, I mean, did you actually think about what this may cost you? Did it cross your mind or did you somehow put it out? Because I've always been fascinated by how you all were able to just do the organizing work in, the, you know, in spite of all the opposition you faced. Well, I guess, in order to go on with this, you had to put that out of your head. We didn't. I know I didn't, and most of us 
didn't think about uh, the negative consequences or think about, um, uh, you know, we did all we could to avoid situations like we used to uh, had a rig to buy cars with a back headlight. Mm. And the tail light would not blow in the dark, so you wouldn't see you when down the highway. But uh, no, I didn't. I did something that I think was very silly and stupid. When I was in Macomb, Mississippi, uh, which is a, a, a tough area, Pike County, I used to wear a, uh, a white, almost white, cream straw hat during the summer, which was dumb. But you know, I didn't think about it that way. I just, uh, I just put it on and went about my mm-hmm. business. Also, we had a big debate in SNCC between nonviolent direct action and whether or not freedom fighters who were fighting in Mississippi and in North Carolina and other places could keep guns uh, in, their, in, their, in their houses, uh, shotguns, anyway. And so we concluded that in, for defense purposes, you, you could do that. So we, didn't, we got past that. Hmm. Well, Mr. We don't Mary- think about it. I think about it now. I said, my God. I remember one time I got arrested in uh, Brookhaven, Mississippi. I got on the bus going to Jackson. Two guys were supposed to go with me. They couldn't make it, so I went by myself. And I sat parallel to, to a, uh, right across the aisle from a white person. He was supposed to sit one back, but I didn't say, hell with that. I'm going to sit right here. And bus driver wanted me to move. I wouldn't move. And then I went, get, they arrested me in Brookhaven. And they put me in a, in a, in a cell at about a four foot uh, fence around it. Then there was the um, bars to the, to the jail right there. So I could just jump over the fence and reach right in doing what they to do. So when I got when I got into cell, I saw, oh my God, I started praying, thinking about it. And I said, what the heck, I can't control this. And I put it in God's hand. And I went to sleep, woke up the next morning at 6.30, uh, 7 o'clock with breakfast, went to court. And the judge said, well, if you promise not to come back here again, we'll let you go. I said, I don't want to come back here. But, <laughs> oh, you don't think about it. I, mean, I know I didn't. I think most of us didn't think about it. Well, Mr. Barry, we want you to hold on for a second. We want to play uh, Barack Obama's acceptance speech. And then we have a, uh, so we want to get your reflections on the 600,000 disenfranchised members of the D.C. area uh, and how that will play as they look at uh the coming 2012 elections. Uh, can we, can we uh, get your permission to do that? Sure. If there is anyone out there who still doubts that America is a place where all things are possible, who still wonders if the dream of our founders is alive in our time, who still questions the power of our democracy, tonight is your answer. It's the answer told by lines that stretched around schools and churches in numbers this nation has never seen, by people who waited three hours and four hours, many for the first time in their lives, because they believed that this time must be different, that their voices could be that difference. It's the answer spoken by young and old, rich and poor, Democrat and Republican, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, gay, straight, disabled and not disabled, Americans who sent a message to the world that we have never been just a collection of individuals or a collection of red states and blue states. We are and always will be the United States of America. It's the answer that led those who've been told for so long by so many to be cynical and fearful and doubtful about what we can achieve to put their hands on the arc of history and bend it once more toward the hope of a better day. It's been a long time coming, but tonight, because of what we did on this day, in this election, at this defining moment, change has come to America. 
that was Barack Obama's acceptance speech in Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, we are joined uh, by uh, Honorable Marion Barry, um, Mer Mel Reeves, and also Don Allen. As we approach the 2012 election, the 2010 census has come into play again. The Voting Rights Act of 65, as Mr. Barry has, has stated, was designed to give, uh, remove the widespread disenfranchisement of, of African Americans, particularly in the southern states. We're seeing, after 40 or 50 years, a new challenge to this Voting Rights Act coming out of Shelby, Alabama, Shelby County, Alabama, where they're trying to say that Congress no, no, no longer needs to re approve the redistricting. And we currently have Clarence Thomas, Supreme Court Justice, who is not necessarily in favor of some of the actions that have come out of the disenfranchisement rules and laws back in the 60s. Could you give us a reflection on that, Mr. Barry? Wait a second. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I can't be but for more minutes here because I got to go down to a hearing. Okay. Uh, but uh, you know, it, I think that Barack understands on whose shoulders he stands. That it just happened magically. That somehow or another it was just luck. Uh, a lot of people shed blood and freedom and, and their lives lost. Some unknown, some known, uh, because of this, and so. I, but I think it, that maybe uh, what I'd like to hear is his acceptance speech uh, in 2012 to see what kind of, whether or not this last four years has sort of sobered him up a little bit in terms of the reality <laughs> of, of what's there. There's a lot of people in this in this country uh, that don't, don't, don't believe that a black man can do anything like that. Then you get this uh, what you call it, um, uh, post-racial syndrome. Yes. Just because Barack's been elected president, do you think there's no more race problems? Shit. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. <laughs> I think you're worked up about it. So. Yes, I understand. <laughs> That's how we talk down here in Washington. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, is no this, station, this is supported. What is it? How is it? Uh, it's listener supported. Yes. Yeah. It's a it's a nonprofit station. It it's not part of Pacifica Network, is it? Uh, yes. 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 It is. Yes. I was on board of Pacifica five six years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and people they gave me the most hell on my issues about <laughs> us purchasing products from from African American companies and et cetera et cetera. We're white liberals, so I had my my hands full, you know. We mm -hmm. finally got them to, they want to put goals and timetables. No, we're not doing that. We're going to put um, absolutely numbers, 20%, uh, 25% of this or 40% of that. But anyway, I got to go down to a hearing on our state superintendent uh, nomination. We got a new mayor here, oh. uh, Vincent Gray. He's going to do an outstanding job. So I had to go down and be supportive. I really appreciate it. I want to come back again sometime. Yes, yes. Well, we we we'll definitely appreciate you taking your time, and uh, uh, we will we'll love to have you back again, Mr. Barry. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. You're listening to KFAI's special day of programming in recognition of Black History Month. You're listening to KFAI 90.3 FM in Minneapolis, 106.7 FM in St. Paul online. You can find us at kfai.org.